Okay, we're going to do advanced interactions now. Um, does anyone know what game this is? Pitfall. Yeah, does anyone know that Pitfall has been redone? Yeah. It just came out recently. I haven't seen it. Um, anyway, there's a snake in there, so it's relevant. Um, <laughs> Python computing uh, for scientific research is a class that we'll be teaching um, essentially immediately after this boot camp ends. Uh, this boot camp is in some ways meant to be a feeder into that. Uh, we, as I hope you have realized, are really only scratching the surface of what's possible. Um, what we'll be doing is essentially teaching uh, each week a different concept of how Python sort of interacts with uh, the, uh, the big scientific world. Um, we have sessions on GUI programming, uh, doing machine learning with Python, um, advanced uh, plotting and visualization, um, symbolic programming, parallelization, building web frameworks, etc. Um, we do hope that uh, you'll take it, and those that can take it for credit, we hope you will, because right now we're in a reasonably small room, and if more people sign up over the next couple of days, we'll get a, a bigger room. <laughs> so there's my pitch. Um, if you're a student, uh, please consider signing up for this. If you're not a student, we're not allowed to um, take auditors, uh, but you're welcome to sit in on a, on a few classes if you'd like. Um, just let us know ahead of time. Okay, we're gonna get into, um, some, in some sense, meta things that Python can do, and the breakout session I think really um, will wind up kind of highlighting just how interesting and powerful Python is um, in this sense. Um, right now we'll talk about lambda functions. These are sometimes called anonymous functions, and this comes from uh, Lisp uh, and functional programming uh, paradigms. Uh, I believe this only entered into the Python language in maybe 2.3, maybe 2.4, so it's fairly new to the language, but it's now pretty baked in. The idea here is instead of saying def, you know, function name, and here are the different arguments, you can more or less create these little functions on the fly as need be, um, and you do that with this thing called lambda. So here, we are gonna wind up asking for one variable, which we'll assign to it um, uh, to be x, and it will return back essentially just the square of that value. And we're going to call this function, even though it's now not anonymous, um, temp. So if I say, what's type temp? It's a function. Um, temp2, basically two will be, x will be assigned to 2, and I will turn back to squared. Um, I can do some more complex things. And in fact, interestingly, I don't even have to create a variable called temp. I can just, on the fly, create a function that does something, and then I wind up um, interacting with um, uh, whatever else I give to it. So these are the arguments of this anonymous function, and you notice I've never even named it. It's just lambda takes x and y, and it returns back x squared plus y. We get back what we expect. I can create a list of lambda functions if I want to. So I'll create a lambda fun, basically doing list comprehension. So I'm gonna wind up creating a list um, where I'll say lambda x, oh sorry, I'm not doing list comprehension here, but you could do it that way. Lambda x, x squared, lambda x, x cubed, lambda y, uh, take the square root. If y is greater than or equal to zero, otherwise return back, really? So now I can um, loop over lambda, all the different lambda functions in that list, and I can print L of minus 1.3, and I get back what I expect. So I didn't have to create named functions. That's one thing that's uh, worth pointing out here. And most of these lambda functions, as you'll wind up using them, will tend to be pretty small. If you really can't do it on one line, or maybe two lines, then you shouldn't be doing lambda functions. You should be actually creating functions on the fly, naming them, and using them. Um, Okay, let me talk about uh, sort, and we'll see how this uh, loops back into lambda functions in just in a second. Remember we asked you um, yesterday to sort on um, essentially different columns within uh, this uh, data structure of all these different flights. Remember we had this list of tuples, and when you just ran um, you know, flights.sort, um, you wound up getting a nice sorted list sorted using the first element. And as was noted in the, um, uh, the breakout uh, session solutions, there are different ways to do this sorting. 
when you actually now want to do sorting not on the first element, which is the default, but you want to do sorting on another element, um, what you can do is use, um, well, help tells us something. Um, we can use uh, this, uh, this is a comparison. So that's actually just um, basically saying how you should do comparison between elements. But here we're going to wind up using this thing called a key. And what you're saying to, uh, what you're saying to the sort function is that I want you to sort each element of what you're given in some way. And I don't really care how you do it, but here's how I want you to do it in this case. So what we're going to do is we're going to say we're going to create an anonymous function which says, okay, your key is going to be the result of what comes back when you actually apply this lambda function onto each individual element, and here you're going to get back the fifth, um, the fifth element within that element. So you had to know something about your data structure, of course, right? But this is really powerful because now I can say, actually, the way in which you should do sorting is, you know, basically use this, right? Use, use this last one, which remember was the time. So now I can just trivially do what took many, many lines of code to do um, yesterday using this Latin function. Does everyone get this? So the key is saying the key is saying to the sort function, um, uh, what is the value that you want me to be comparing? And when you have an abstract concept like a tuple, you know, the native sort function says, I don't know how to compare tuples to tuples, so I'll just go into the first element of this tuple and I'll just compare those. And what you wind up seeing when you ran the sort function just out of the box, so flights.sort, um, open parentheses, close parentheses, you wind up getting everything ordered by the airline name, which was actually the answer to the first question. And then it actually, if you notice, within each airline, it then sorted on the next element. So Southwest 145 came after Southwest um, 23, because that's just how sort works natively. But now you can tell it, no, 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 I want you to use a different value. Is there another question out there? There were a couple of questions. Yeah. So I could use this to pass the field in any particular order and sort on that tuple. Yes, exactly. That's a good point. So it doesn't just have to be one value. You could now give it a bunch of, you could give it a tuple that gives like the time, then the airline, and then the gate number. And you know, if it's, you know, has to go farther and farther down into more and more elements, it will do that to get the sorting right. Very good. Yeah, question. Why do the numbers get? Uh, they got changed. Oh yeah. So we, um, I mentioned this a couple times yesterday. There is um, the notion that these numbers, if they're floats, are stored at this, as essentially 16 bits. And when you print that out, when you print a number out whose uh, whose value is being stored as a 16 bit, Python tries to be nice to print it out in a way that it thinks that you really want to see it. But when you're just actually, um, I, you know, I notice I haven't even done a print here. Um, it's just basically rendering the values, and it's got a slightly different concept than, uh, than actually printing. So this is the closest representation it knows how to get to those values that I've put in. And remember, we did a truth statement yesterday where I said, is 11.3 blah, 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 equal to 11.3? And the answer is yes. Any other questions? So in fact, for multi-column uh, sorting, so now you don't want to just sort on one thing, you want to sort on multi multiple things. Another way to do this that was also introduced uh, briefly yesterday by Chris is not to use a lambda function, but to use this thing called an item getter. And you can see uh, from the doc strings of what item getter actually does, it returns a callable object that fetches uh, item from its um, from its uh, operand using operands get item. Um, and this is an underscore sort of uh, uh, method um, that knows how to operate on lists and, and tuples and, and other iterables. Um, I won't go into the details of this, but what this basically is saying here is exactly what we could have done and constructed with a lambda function um, where it says, okay, sort on the time, which is the fourth element, and then sort on the gate, on the gate, or no, the flight number, and then sort on the airline. Um, I'm going to breeze through a couple of other built-in uh, functions within, um, within Python 
filter, map, reduce, and uh, zip. Because in some sense, many of these you kind of already know how to do within list comprehension. Um, filter returns a sequence consisting of those items from the sequence for which function item is true. So um, here we have a list comprehension thing that we had just basically reproduced from last time, where I want to go all the numbers from 0 to 100. I want to save those numbers if um, bitwise uh, I basically have in the, in the second to last bit a, a 1, and in the last bit I have a 1, and I want to make sure that it's exactly divisible um, by 11. Sorry, not divisible by 11. Um, and here's my list. Instead, what I can do is create a function, and this could have been an anonymous function, but we'll just name it for now, which will basically do all the stuff that's happening on the right-hand side, and um, it's going to wind up returning what type of variable? What, what's being evaluated in this return statement? What's the results of everything that's inside of these parentheses? Booleans, right? So I'm going to get a Boolean response from this. I'm going to get a Boolean response from this, a Boolean response from this, effectively. And I'm handing all those things together. So I can now, instead of doing the list comprehension in the way that you saw um, on the top line, I can now run this thing called filter, where I take, um, I take f, which is my filter, and I'm going to give it, uh, I'm going to give it a range from 0 to 100. Um, if the input is a string, so is the output. So it doesn't just have to work on numbers. So Charlie Brown said something really nasty. Um, and now I'm going to use a lambda function instead of having to name this. And what is this lambda function going to do? It's going to basically say, OK, the I'm going to input uh, by character. Because why is this going to be a character? I'm going to give it a. a is an iterable. right? I can, I can loop over this. Um, I can loop over this variable, uh, C in string um, ASCII. So what I'm basically asking for is a truth statement at every character. Are you in the ASCII letters or not? Charlie Brown said. Right. I removed even the white spaces, because white spaces are not part of the string dot ASCII letters um, uh, attribute. Everyone see what's happening? The results of what goes into one of these functions, whatever you wind up giving it, has to come back with essentially a Boolean. And that, if, it's, if it comes back to be true for that element, it gets saved. If not, it gets tossed. Yes? Ah, I'll come to that in just a little bit. It's faster and sort of nicer than range. Um, so very briefly, X range it returns an iterable. So it's actually an object that can be iterated over. Range returns a list, um, which of course can also be iterated over. But if X range was a very large number, um, if, I wanted, if I wanted a range over you know, 100 trillion numbers, um, it would take a very, very long time to create the list, whereas X range would return immediately. Um, OK, so I can do the same thing that I had before. Um, instead of having to define this function, I can just create a lambda function for my filter, and then I can filter the numbers out. Um, let me sort of mention briefly about X range. I think you had this in um, one of your uh, breakouts from Paul yesterday. Um, just to be clear about um, the difference between X range and range, X range <laughs> creates an iterable version of range. Range actually returns a list. Um, so if I want to actually use the magic function called time it, which is nice if you want to know how long some snippet of your code is running, um, this only works within IPython. Um, you can say uh, percent sign time it. I want to know the length of the result of having done this filter. Uh, and I've created that same sort of crazy filter I had um, from before. And I'm just going to do a range of one. So I'm just going to basically get one number back. It, it decides, well, to be absolutely sure, I'm going to do essentially a million loops. And I'm going to tell you that the best of the, the, the three best loops that I got were some, something like uh, 973 nanoseconds per loop. Um, if I want to do that in X range, um, it was slightly faster. So you say, OK, not a big deal. 
And why is that? Well, because X range basically gets built up really quickly, returns an iterable. Um, the, when you build a list, you actually have to put that into memory and pass that along, and that takes just a little bit longer. But let's try a slightly larger number. So we're going to now filter on all of this and get back my, my, crazy, uh, my crazy list. And notice I'm not, I don't really care what the result is. I just want to know, um, you know, I want to actually just do that filtering. I want to know how long it is. We time it. 5.9 seconds per loop to do that with the normal range. Because again, I had to create a very big list in memory. If I do it in X range, it's much less time. So very rarely will you actually need to create range. Um, you'll actually almost always just be doing X range. And just like, uh, just like um, range, it can be reversed. Um, reverse is another built-in function. Um, we won't uh, go, we probably won't use that very much. Um, map is another way to do list comprehension as well. Um, so let's say I've got a nice little function called qubit, which returns the cube of a number. Um, basically, I can uh, now not return back uh, true or false, as I did with filter. I'm now going to wind up returning back the result of whatever gets shoved into it element by element. So I'm going to get back the cubes of all the numbers going from 1 to 10, sorry, 1 to 9. Yeah? So if you give qubit your a, a list of steps, will it operate on all of them automatically, or will it only operate on a single element? Um, well, the map function is expecting the second item, that the second argument, to be an iterable. If I gave it a string, it says, oh, you've only given me a string. I'll just iterate over the characters. If I've given a list, it'll iterate over all the items in the list. And if what's inside of that is a tuple at every element level, like if I gave it the airlines list, then or the flights list, then qubit would barf, right? Because I don't know how to take the cube of a tuple. So um, qubit doesn't really care what you give it, um, except you know we're implicitly expecting it to give to give it a number. Again, I don't have to actually call anything uh, qubit. I don't have to pollute my namespace with a function that I really only need to uh, do once. I can use a anonymous function, and I get back the same result. Um, uh, reduce is uh, again sort of a sort of different drill down into iterating over over data. It returns only one value. It returns a single value constructed by calling the binary function on the first two items of the sequence, and then on the result of the next item, and so on and so on. So what does that mean? My function that I'm going to wind up uh, using to do the reduction will um, have to take two arguments, so that's why I've got the x and the y, and I'm just going to return back the summation of that. And when I've looped over all of the what's in this um, iterable here, I'm going to return back a single number. Right? In this case, it's the summation of the numbers from, uh, from 1 to 9. I can time that, again, with x range, um, and uh, see that it's 2 microseconds per loop. Um, I can also use the built-in function called sum, um, and it should be faster, and it is indeed faster. Um, so, you know, typically if you're doing these sort of very simple operations with numbers, you're either going to do it with the built-in or you're going to just sort of jump over to numpy space and you're going to have lots of things you can do on the numpy side of things. Um, zip is actually something pretty powerful. It's not something that you do in list comprehension, although you could you could actually implement this uh, this way. Zip basically takes um, a bunch of arguments and it loops over elements within each of those arguments at the same time. So you think of basically um, looping over i and equal spam at the same time, and then going to the next thing and then the next thing. And it basically does what you think zip might do. It pairwise concatenates those items together. So it returns a bunch of tuples. Because I gave it two arguments, um, essentially two lists, I got back a list of tuples that each had two elements in it. If I gave it uh, zip essentially three arguments, then I would get back a list of tuples with um, three of them in it. Um, and here's an example of that. So it should say i eggs, you know, 
u equal dark knight, et cetera. Sorry, I spam u x. Um, and you see that it wind up sort of um, concatenating all those together. It's not necessarily obvious that you see where you might use this, but it's kind of nice if you're given a bunch of, let's say, lists or a bunch of different tuples, and you really need to pack them all together so you can then iterate over them in turn, right? Rather than saying, you know, the index, uh, I'll, loop over, I'll loop over this list, I'll grab index i, and then I'll get that element, the ith element. Now you can just loop over these things um, at the same time. What happens, hold on one sec, what happens if I don't have exactly the, the same, what happened here? <laughs> strange. Does somebody have like an IR, um, uh, one of those? You don't have TV be gone for the, for the professor. Um, what happens if, so this has one, two, three elements in it, one, two, three elements, one, two elements. What do you think zip does? Do you think it throws an error or do you think it tries to do something? It tries to do something. It says, look, I can only zip the first two because after that, things get, un, you know, get un, unequal. I don't have enough to zip, basically. Instead of throwing an error, it will do the best that it can. So here's a list, a name, quest, favorite color. Here's some answers, Lancelot, the Holy Grail, blue. For A, for Q, comma A in zip questions, answers. So I'm now zipping the questions and the answers together, and I'm going to loop through the result of that. And each time I go through that loop, I'm going to wind up getting another question, another answer. I can say, What's your percent sign S? It is percent sign S. It's a very nice, clean way of looping through multiple, uh, multiple variables essentially at the same time. Any questions about that? Yes. Could you use that to create dictionaries pretty quickly? You have two things you need to assign like that. Yeah, so instead, so you could say, you can run this zip thing up here, and then you could just say dict. D-I-C-T around that, and then you've got a dictionary. Good. OK, um, error handling. Um, this is a, a famous Saturday Night Live uh, sketch that I liked a lot. Um, this is where they're doing Jeopardy, and uh, Seinfeld was a guest. Um, and it's basically comedians doing Jeopardy. So um, he says, let's go to airplanes for 200. And he says, airplanes for 200. And the, the question is, or the answer is, and what's the deal with the black box? And then somebody buzzes in and he says, it's the only thing that survives a crash. Why don't they build the whole plane out of the black box? Um, so uh, I guess that's not funny when I tell it. But um, <laughs> one of the really nice things is that um, Python has a very nice way of catching problems. Every time that I've shown you, basically, that we've done something that the Python interpreter says is wrong, it's not conforming to the Python syntax, we've just essentially thrown an error. And if you're running a big code, and you, you, know, you have an experiment that has to finish by tomorrow, and you just have some crazy bug that you hadn't caught before because you've gotten farther along in your code base, um, you could get in a lot of trouble, right? Um, so one of the things that's nice is that you have a way of sort of catching places within your code that potentially could be volatile. So if you've got, say, an input from a user and they could, you could ask them what temperature is it, and they say, meh. You probably want to catch you know, your coercion of the response of that into, a, um, into an integer or into a float. You want to make sure that you're doing something graceful with that, and you don't just completely crash out of your code. So the try except finally is um, the real sort of base primitive of how Python does that. We wrap um, volatile code in try except finally, give you an example of this. So um, here, I'm asking for uh, a number, and I'm going to square it. I'll take the float of that number, and then I'll square it, enter a number, and I say Monty. Right now, I would just throw an error, and that would be it. Instead, um, let's uh, create a function. And again, I'm sorry you're not seeing the indentations um, here as they should appear, but there, is, there should be an indentation after I start defining a function f. Um, I'm going to wrap volatile stuff inside of a try block. And I'll ask the same question. I'll say print flow temp. And then I'll say, well, if that failed, if that threw some sort of error, say, dude, I asked you for a number, and whatever you gave me is not a number. 
no matter what, so this is what this finally is, and finally is, a, um, is, is essentially optional. If you have a try, basically if you have a try, you have to have an accept. And you can't have an accept by itself. So like you can have an if statement um, where you uh, can or, or don't have to have an else statement after that, you um, can or don't have to have a finally statement at the end of this. I say thanks for playing, so now if I just run f, enter a number and I'll square it, and I say three, thanks for playing. Enter a number and I say Monty, dude I asked you for the number and Monty is not a number, thanks for playing. So it, it always will execute whatever happens inside of finally, um, but depending upon what happens here, if you throw an error, then uh, you can behave differently. So this is a fairly graceful way to deal with something which is volatile. Yeah? Can you put a pass in the exception? You can put a pass in the exception. If you don't want to deal with the exception at all, and it's actually not a big deal that you've got an exception, but you, need to have a you have to have a pass because it's a block, and you have to have a no-op inside of it. You need to have the exception, you can have a Right, you cannot have a try without an accept. And you cannot have an accept without a try. Um, right, that's a very good question. It's, it's basically, um, it's, one way to think about it is this, is any, this whole thing is now kind of the block of the stuff that I'm not really sure how it's going to go. And so finally is saying regardless of how things go, essentially good or bad, um, do something, right? So it could be that if you're trying to close down a file um, and you want to sort of log something right as somebody's closing something, you actually just want to make sure at the very end you've closed down that file in the way that you wanted to close it down. Um, but you know, in the end, you're absolutely right. There is no difference, I believe, with just having this line um, outside of that block. Okay. Um, again, volatile stuff uh, up top, um, dealing with your exception in the red, and then regardless, you want to just essentially print something out. Errors in Python generate what are called exceptions. Exceptions can be handled differently depending upon what the exceptions are. And um, when you do an accept uh, statement, you are catching those exceptions. Um, you don't have to catch exceptions if you don't want to. Um, and as I said, finally block is executed no matter what. Yes? I think the, the difference with the finally, the reason you need it is that if you have an exception and you put something out, outside of the accept and there was no finally, that would not be run. So if you wanted to close the file and right. so if you wanted your accept, but you didn't have it in a finally, it if, would not run. If you wanted to take some action inside of the exception and you wanted to make sure that what happened inside of the finally actually happened, you could you would do it that way. Um, but for most cases you might be able to get away with it having no finally and just put something outside. I actually don't I don't often use Um, we'll show the example. We'll show the example of, of exactly that right now. So here's a try. Um, eat at Joe's, and that's obviously uh, volatile because I haven't defined what Joe's is. Finally, buy. Um, so if I just run that, I say buy. Um, and why is that? Because I had an error. I didn't catch the exception, but I had a finally. So I, may, I think I misspoke. You don't have to have an accept if you have a try, as long as you have a final. Okay. Oh wait, no, it got thrown. So wait, backtrack again. Because it, it didn't have the accept, so it didn't catch it the didn't accept. catch the error, but it's not it's not in let me put it this way, it's not incorrect Python syntax not to have the accept as long as you have the finally, except I didn't catch the error, right? So I didn't sort of gobble that up and say, Don't worry, I know how to handle that. Um, it just continued to pass through. So in, in terms of being in a function you were calling, it would make sure that, say, the file was closed, but it would still pass the, the error up to another level. Yeah, that's why, you, that's why you would do it in this way. I've very rarely done it this way, but yes, this would work. Um, OK, uh, now a little bit more of the meta stuff. And this is what's really neat about Python. I think one of the really neat things is that um, because you're sort of just executing code in time and you're not compiling the whole thing, 
um, you can be more or less uh, creating strings that themselves could be executed as if they were part of your script. And you don't even know what those strings are. Exact is a, is a statement which executes strings as if they were Python code. So if I say uh, A equals print check it, and I do exec A, it will print check it. So I might not know until the beginning of this code and during runtime what's, what A is going to be, but I can just execute it. You can imagine this might be a little volatile if I said A equals OS system rm star dot star. You know, pseudo rm star dot star. Um, that could be really bad, right? So you usually don't want to expose exec to people. Um, you really have to know what you're doing when you're doing this. Um, you're dynamically creating Python code, and then you're executing that code as if it was uh, you know, part of your normal um, flow, and whatever happens with that code will become part of your namespace. So I don't have to actually just print something, I could actually assign a variable. So I might not even know what the name of my variable is until runtime, and now I say A equals X equals 4.6, 4.56, now I can print X, and it's got meaning. That's a little bit like, whoa, right? Um, okay, I can delete X if I want to. Um, oh, interestingly, what happened here? Why, didn't this, why did this not work? Why did I throw an error? Because I deleted X out of my namespace. Okay? Um, yes? Does the variable know its name? Does the variable know its name? Yeah. In what sense? In the sense that, for example, like, the variable A, for example, we know when we look at the code, but the variable itself can it accept its name. No. Okay. Um, import math, so I'll just loop over something. While true, uh, what, what built-in function would you like me to co-opt? What new name would you like me to give it? So I will basically say exec something equals something. What built-in function would you like me to co-op? Math.sign. I'm going to call it Monty underscore sign. What function would you like me to co-op? Range. I'm going to call it Python range. And now if I type Monty underscore sign, math.py uh, 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 divided by 2, I get what I expect, as if I was executing sign. Monty range 3, 0, 1, 2. I haven't actually deleted uh, math.sign out of my namespace. All I've done is I've created another variable that is effectively pointing to the function that is exposed by those built-ins. And I've done this where basically the user is just, you're, I'm dynamically generating code, right, as I'm, as I'm running through this thing. Yes? Um, no, absolutely not. If, you, if, you, if you're done and you, you, you quit out, you've not saved any of that. If you really wanted that, let's say you wanted this to persist, what you could do is save the strings um, that I have right here, and you could save those into a file, and then as you start up again, you could say, here are all the things that I've co-opted um, from the built-in functions, and here's what their new names are, here's what I'm calling them, and you could just exec all of that stuff, and you, that, would, that would work if you needed to persist. Eval is an expression which evaluates strings as Python expressions. So if I eval a string of the number 5, um, I'm going to wind up getting x equals 5. If I evaluate the string, which is percent sign %d plus 6, and I give it x, now x is in my namespace, 5 plus 6 is 11. Um, and again, I'm not printing this response out here. I'm basically just evaluating this, and I get a number out of that. Um, and I'm whatever comes out of that result of the evaluation gets um, fed into x. Absolute value of that number um, of 100. Um, if I want to print 5, what's the result of a print statement? It doesn't really make any sense. Print is a statement. It's not an expression. 2.0. So I get an error. Um, if 1, so that's always true, x equals 4, um, that's a statement that's not an expression. Whenever you have a block of code, that's going to be a statement. How are exactly analogous? 
Um, well, they're quite different, right? So exec is just saying, take this string and evaluate it as if it was in my script. Um, evaluate, or eval, basically says take this string, do whatever Python can do as if this was Python code, take the result of that and assign it and basically return it so that this can get assigned to that. You notice in the previous slide, I didn't say x equals, I just said in the string, x equals something. Um, so that, that's going to fail. Okay, so we'll jump into the breakout. Um, this is hopefully going to be fun. Uh, I want you to write code which generates Python code that approximates the function x squared plus x. Okay, so you should just say x, you know, two stars, two plus x. That's pretty easy. But I, I want you to do this randomly. This is sort of essentially like genetic programming. Um, randomly generate lambda functions using a restricted vocabulary. So you're only allowed to use these things here. And then I want you to evaluate these lambda functions at a fixed number of x values and save the difference between those answers and basically your best uh, approximation of x squared plus x will be the one where I wind up having no differences. And obviously you have to catch errors if you're randomly generating functions. Many of them will be nonsensical. So what does it mean by um, uh, get a fixed number of values? Let's say you want to make sure that your function behaves exactly like x squared plus x between minus 10 and 10. So you might create some, uh, you might create some list of numbers, and you might create a lambda function that iterates over those uh, numbers, returns back the values of that, and you know how much the answer should wind up being. Um, so you could actually sum the the squares of all the differences, um, and then you wind up basically getting something which will wind up, if it's done right, will wind up approximating um, x squared plus x over that interval range. Yes? Since your vocabulary has x twice, are we supposed to understand that this is a vocabulary that gets exhausted as each character is used? No, the way I would think about it um, is that, and the reason why we did this is just to push things to go a little bit faster, is that what we want you to essentially use the um, random uh, module within Python and randomly generate a random number of characters from that vocabulary to create your lambda function. And we have two x's in there just because um, it speeds up the process by which your code will wind up finding the answer. If I only had one x, it would, you'd find it eventually, but it, it would take too long. So an example of this might be randomly pick a couple of, uh, let me pick a number from three to seven. Throw, give me a number, three to seven. Five, okay, so let me pick five numbers, five characters randomly. One, two, three, four, five. And now let me essentially put those together as a character. I can then create a lambda function out of that by basically doing an exec, or a deval, depending on how you want to do that. And now I can apply that lambda function, so I could do a math, for instance, or I could do a list comprehension on a bunch of numbers from minus 1 to uh, whatever, 10, or minus 10 to, to 10. And then I can get the results of that. And sometimes, in fact, most of the time, it's going to fail, because it won't be a valid Python expression. If I just randomly pull characters out of that, it's not going to be a valid Python expression. But every now and then, you'll get a valid Python expression. And it will actually evaluate on numbers. Um, and you will basically wind up finding x squared plus x. Okay, go for it.